Now, I hope you're all relaxed. Next part of the evening is about to begin. Now, before we present the awards, we have a master class with a very special, <laughs> very special and inspiring business leader. His name is Rakesh Kapoor. He is the CEO of Reckitt Benkiza, the 11th biggest company on the FTSE 100 with a market capitalization, ladies and gentlemen, of $65 billion. Yep. Rakesh, yeah, that's worth a round of applause in itself, isn't it? Come on. This is success, which is what we're celebrating. Rakesh was born in Bareilly in Uttar Pradesh and graduated from the Birla Institute of Technology and Science. He joined what was then Reckitt and Coleman back in 1987. And after stints working for the company in Asia and Europe, he was appointed chief executive in September. Under his leadership, the company has grown at an exponential rate. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Rakesh Kapoor, Chief Executive of RB. Rakesh Kapoor, ladies and gentlemen, what a man. How are you? Very good. Now, um, firstly, uh, I just want to get a little show of hands. Uh, hands up if you use Nurofen. Yeah, you certainly will be in about a couple of hours' time. Uh, Dettol? Harpic? Silip Bang? Durex? Well, that's why there are so many Asian children, quite frankly. <laughs> Not enough hands went up there. Well, these are all companies, as well as 14 others, in the portfolio of Reckitt Benkiza, which we will call RB for the remainder of this interview. $65 billion company, and its CEO is this man here, ladies and gentlemen. Rakesh Kapoor. Um, let's start at the risk of me sounding like a GCSE Sigmund Freud with your childhood. Now, I know Shailesh uh, Solanke interviewed you, and there was a story about you playing marbles and your mother asking you a question. Tell us about that story. Well, this is a long, long time ago. Uh, and the year I was born, I think the literacy levels in the city and the state I was born in were probably one in five. So I had a 20% chance of being literate. Uh, what did happen, of course, was because the literacy levels were not very high, I was doing reasonably well in the people who were literate. And I used to get to first without really working very hard. So I remember playing marbles one day and my mom said, why are you playing marbles? You have your final exams tomorrow morning. And I said to her, I'm going to get to first without having to work anyway. So it was that moment in time she said, you need to be moved away from the school and the city. And then I was shunted at a very young age. If I was less than 13. And I was shunted away from this very small town in UP to what I believe was the very single best school in India at that time, which is a modern school in New Delhi. And suddenly from finding myself from the top of the class, I immediately slotted in in the middle of the class from then on. 
And from then on, actually, the bar had been raised actually forever for me. Um, and therein, I learned my first major lesson in life, that to get the best out of people, you need to keep raising the bar. And to get the best out of yourself, you have to get yourself out of the comfort zone. And this is what I apply all the time uh, in my life, just to get to do better and better every day. And that, of course, is something you very much bring to RB, and we'll speak more about that later on. There's another story when you were a child and you were given some Ayurvedic medicine, a pill. Well, th that story is not really very clear to even me. Actually, I spoke to my mom. I mean, four years ago, I, be, I had the honor of being the CEO of this company, and I asked her, uh, I, I'm such an ordinary person, and, and did you see anything when I was younger which told you that I had some very exciting things to be doing in my life? And she said, she, she had to think quite hard, by the way. I mean, <laughs> this obviously, there wasn't very exciting things. But uh, she did tell me that um, when I was a young child, she had taken me to a doctor, uh, not a... Uh, not the kind of doctors we have in this country, but some kind of a uh, Ayurvedic doctor probably in some faraway place called Ratlam. I was very young and I came back with, and I asked her what for and she wouldn't tell me even now. She hasn't told me what was wrong with me, but there was obviously something very wrong. Um, and and I, I you had to take that pill every day. Um, one fine day she, she decided to actually take that pill herself. And she said, I took that pill and realized just how awful it was. It was just absolutely awful to taste. And I can't, she said, I couldn't believe that actually you've been taking that pill every day and you haven't complained once. So I thought to myself, this is a, uh, this is a young kid who, who just probably gets on with whatever he has to do without actually complaining. And perhaps it's also an important lesson for all of us, uh, which is, and in fact, in that sense, my mother was a role model. Uh, if you want to be a leader in a company or you want to be a leader, the first thing is you need to be able to taste the same bitter pill that you're giving everyone else. Take it yourself and see what it means. Because most of the time, it's very easy for us to tell people what to do without having to do it ourselves. And the second important lesson actually here is that there are many, many bitter pills in life. And we have to swallow them all the time. And we just have to move on and rise, rise above the immediacy of pain. And that's what success is all about. So how then do you deal, Rakesh Ji, with disappointment? Like I said, you know... Are you, are you an emotional person? Do you manage to compartmentalize very easily? I'm, I'm very emotional. Uh, actually, God has all given us two sides of our brain. Uh, and I think we have to use both sides in equal measure. Uh, my wife uses, uses one more than the other, uh, and I somehow <laughs> use the other That's going to be a bit awkward <laughs> later on, Rakesh Ji. <laughs> uh, but, but yes, I'm emotional as, as, as when I have to be, uh, and when I, uh, maybe most of the time. Um, but you're quite a, you, you, I mean, reading about you, you're, a, you're quite a tough taskmaster because you swallow that bitter pill, you don't complain about it, you don't expect anyone else to complain about that bitter pill. I, I got a quote from you which is, don't expect me to hug you when you meet targets. I mean, <laughs> I'm absolutely right. I mean, listen, you know, I have a very simple philosophy for my own company. Um, <laughs> many, many companies hire professionals because, of course, professionals are important to make progress uh, for companies. I, I don't believe uh, in hiring professionals. I believe in hiring people who can truly act like owners of a company. Because professionals build their resumes. Owners build their companies. Wow. And, and I want my people to come into work every day as if it's their first day of life at work and not their last, second last, or the 10th anniversary. But when you have a company which is as large as you as an umbrella, of course, RB for lots of other companies, how successfully can you engender that philosophy to so many people? I think it's not very difficult because, you know, 
first of all, I, I talked about role modeling. Uh, it's not just me, all the leadership team of my company is a role model for all of us. I learn from them all the time, I look up to them. Uh, and I think that is the role that we can all play, which is to inspire each other to do our best work every day. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. The other thing is this is a demanding company. I have never said that our company is an easy company to work for. I don't know whether you have the one chart I brought. We, we're going to show that next, okay. actually. We're okay. going to show that next. Because that is all about our, what our company does. Uh, I expect everyone to, to do more than I expect from them. And that creates a, a level of uh, enthusiasm and excitement where everyone is allowed to do what they want, but knowing that it all makes a big difference. What are divorce rates like in your business? <laughs> I'm just, uh, just uh, wondering that. that, I've, that I've, I've stayed married to my wife <laughs> for, for 30 years. 30 years, and, ladies and gentlemen. 30 years. <laughs> Perfect. Um, let's see this graph now. Can I, can I change that statement? Yes, go on. My wife has stayed married to me for yeah, 30 years. Yeah, there you go. That's the, that's, that's the smart money. Exactly right. Well done. You saved that, Thank Rakesh. You. Yeah. Um, now, we want to see this graph, because if you'd invested £100 in RB in 2000, it would be worth about £1,500 today. Now, investing that same amount at FTSE 100 back in 2000 would have yielded £153. Now, that gives you a sense, ladies and gentlemen, of just how powerful the growth of these companies are. Well, I think you should put that chart again, in my opinion, because I think this chart typifies what RB has done. So if Let's show the graph chart. again. Let's just show the graph again so Rakesh Ji can uh, explain. Yeah. There you go. So I, I, I think it's very possible that all of you have heard our brands and, and maybe not the company, and, which is quite understandable because we don't talk about the company, we talk about the brands. But if you did not hear about my company, uh, that's absolutely fine. But if you did not invest in my company, you've really made a big mistake. <laughs> you really have, because if you put if you put 100,000 pounds, which is possible, in the year 2000, you would have been sitting with 1.5 million pounds. Wow. And, wow. And, and actually... Did you, you do that? Yeah, well, I have, I have to have... In, um, <laughs> talk like owners of the company. I have to have a substantial uh, amount of share ownership in my own company. Yes. So, uh, well, and you can look at how well this company has done over the last 15 <laughs> years compared to to the likes of Unilever, Colgate, Procter & Gamble, and of course, FTSE 100. I'm really proud of what this company has achieved. I mean, that kind of relentless growth, I mean, the challenges you face with people, you know, and keeping them at that pace must be very, very difficult. I don't think so. Like I said, we, we, I just talked about a concept of hiring owners rather yes, than professionals. Yes, yes, But there aren't that many owners around, are there? I mean, well, there are, all of us. There are 40,000 people in my company, and each one of us has an opportunity to act like an owner every day. Mm. Uh, we, we, like I said to people, in my company, and I, I really mean it with everything, you can be anyone. You can come and disagree with me. You can say what your point of view is. And if, if you have real passion and belief for your ideas, I'm going to allow you to go ahead and do it for, for you. Because if you really believe in something, I think people need to have the chance to be able to get it done. Large companies sometimes stifle creativity, sometimes stifle innovation, sometimes stifle, if I have to say so, individuality mm. of people. And that's not good for business. Business does not thrive because everyone thinks the same way. Business thrives when you have differences of opinion, when people have a point of view, when people can come and say, this is not working, this is what we should do differently, and they have the courage to say to the CEO of the company. Um, if I was to ask anonymously, of course, your executives to tell me their number one complaint about you, what do you think they would say? I don't think you should ask them. There was a, I said it in front of investors. Uh, we launched um, 12 months ago um, a, in China for, for the time being something called a personalized condom, since you've already disclosed to people what, a personalized one, condom. A personalized condom. So you can actually go to the website, choose the design you want, choose the sun sign you want, choose the slogan you want. 
What a great chat up line that would be, Rakesh Ji. I, I, I encourage all of you to actually go and visit that online website. It's in Chinese for the time being, and therefore you might have to brush up on your Hopefully management. the Chinese president has presented the David Cameron with right. one of those uh, right. uh, 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 present trip that he's... Uh, actually, actually, the Chinese president got it for David Cameron. <laughs> um, a personalized uh, version of it. And, and when the, my team were presenting me the idea, Yes. When, when they were presenting me this idea about this personalized condom, they had made one for me. <laughs> which had a message, don't push so hard. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't think any of us thought that was coming, did we? Yeah. And you, that wasn't a pun either, right. You asked for it. Yeah, yes, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, That's quite a lot, that. actually, yeah. Now, um, I mean, you've been at RB for, for 30 years. Now, what do you think you had in that company that those who wanted that job didn't have? Oh, wow. Well, that, that, I think, is a very unfair question. I think uh, anyone in my company has the opportunity to be the CEO of the company. Um, but the truth is, they, they, there's something you have. I mean, there's, there's multiple things that you have. I think I, I, I'm lucky. There is no question about it. You know, you need a lot of luck to be where you are. And I think I, I, I had my fair share of luck. This is all I can attribute it to. Who's the most inspirational leader to you and why? Okay, there are many, many people and we all have uh, in our lives. My mom, my father was an inspirational leader. My family is inspirational to me. So I think we can seek inspiration from everywhere. I don't think we need to depend on one source of inspiration. There's so much around us on your tables too. And in terms of CEOs, you are one of only two Asian CEOs, the FTSE 100. Why do you think that is? Do you think there is a glass ceiling? I don't, I really don't think like that. I think uh, I have an executive committee of eight people, seven different nationalities out of eight. Uh, we have our top 40 managers, 15 are different nationalities. So the point here is that diversity in my company is a way of life. I talked about deliberately having people who don't agree with each other. I think it's, it's very easy to build a consensual culture in a company. I think that's very wrong. I think companies need to build a culture where people have to fight for e their ideas, well, you, to you fight said, to make each other better. Because you said the best way for you to give me ideas is to take resources away from you. Absolutely, uh, and that's true, and, I, uh, and the reason is very simple. I think when companies become very large, they have a lot of money, they become cash rich, idea poor. Think about entrepreneurs, and we have so many entrepreneurs in this room actually. Yes, we do. Entrepreneurs, by and large, when they start life, they are cash poor and ideas rich. So there is a parallel here somewhere that when you have more money, you have less ideas. When you have less money, you somehow come, come up with new ideas, you come up with creativity. I can assure you, if I took all your money away just now and asked you to get home, you're going to find a very creative way to do that. Mm. Yeah. So having more money is actually not a blessing, it's a problem for creativity and innovation. I mean, for this- Can't wait till I have that problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, lastly, Today, I interviewed on my BBC Asia Network show an 18-year-old who is the youngest owner of an Indian takeaway in the UK, right? And he's an extraordinary young man. Now, knowing what you know now, if you were to meet your 18-year-old self, considering it's back to the future day, um, what would you tell him? So first of all, I'd love to be 18 again. <laughs> because the 18 year olds... Are, Maybe that should are, have been are, on the condom. Yeah, exactly. They're having a lot of fun. And when I was 18, I didn't have as much fun. So I mean, I think it would be just absolutely amazing to be 18 again. It's just a most amazing time to be 18. 
but very seriously, if I yes. have to say something to an 18-year-old kid, and I, uh, is there anyone 18 or so in this room? Probably no one. So I, I think mean, one, of, one of the Solanke family, definitely. But no, I, I think, you know, maybe I'm, I'm talking to very, very um, extraordinarily uh, successful people. But to an 18-year-old people, uh, somebody, I would say the following. I would say that as an 18-year-old, your greatest need and your greatest risk is the need to succeed. The need to always find yourself on the right-hand side of the bell curve. But to my mind, you can never be really successful without taking a risk. And to my mind, with every risk, there is a possible failure. And I count every failure as a boon. And today, I'm as lucky and as happy with my failures as I am with my small successes. So I'll tell this 18-year-old kid, do something bold, try something different, break something, and then ask for permission. Ladies and gentlemen, Rakesh Kapoor, what an absolute inspiration.